Thank you very much. Is this on? Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Gunnar, for, for that introduction. My name is Katarina Tratsch, and I'm the director of Stockholm Free World Forum, or FRIVÄRD, as you might know us as. It is my pleasure to today moderate the first session of this highly relevant conference, uh, namely a session on information warfare in a new age, in the age we're living in. When I think about the times of today, I think about how completely absorbed we are by information and by the information age. At the start of each day, we wake up and we shower ourselves in communication and information of various sorts. From looking at the display of our phones in the morning that we use to wake up, we see the flashes of the night that we have missed, and then we continue throughout the day checking our messages, our emails, uh, our social media accounts, um, well, news media, and so forth. By nightfall, we are usually completely soaked by various messages of information and communication. The shift to this information age happened very rapidly. Uh, and it's not until recently that we have started to think about the consequences that this era has for us, on ourselves as individuals, but also on our societies as a whole. During the past few years, awareness has also been raised on how information and information technologies affect us from a security standpoint. With the Russian illegal annexation of Crimea and the following war in eastern Ukraine, awareness started to be raised that these issues could actually threaten us and could be treated from a military standpoint. Furthermore, since it became clear that Russia had interfered in the US presidential elections, these issues sort of climbed to the top of the agenda. Information warfare, or fake news, as the term is popularly called, has now become one of the issues that we discuss the most. Yet, information warfare is about so much more than fabricated news. I think it's about the entire way that we live our lives, communicating and consuming information constantly, and about the new vulnerabilities that we see as a consequence of this. So it is my hope that today, in this first session, we will discuss and dissect these issues thoroughly. Uh, we will see how information warfare manifests itself in different societies in the past and in present, and how what Sweden can learn from this ahead of the elections in September to Parliament that are being held. And with us to discuss this, we have two uh, very distinguished experts. First, we have Edward Lucas, who is Senior Vice President of the Center for European Policy Analysis, and until quite recently, a Senior Editor at The Economist. Edward's expertise includes energy, cybersecurity, espionage, Russian foreign and security policy, politics and economics of Eastern Europe, etc. They're all the same thing. <laughs> well, you know, you wrote your presentation, I didn't. <laughs> he writes for a number of newspapers, including the London Times, the Independent, the Sunday, Ti Sunday Times, and Svenska Dagbladet here in Sweden and has published a number of books, including The New Cold War, Putin's Russia and the Threat to the West, Deception, The Untold Story of East-West Espionage, and Cyberphobia, Identity, Trust, Security, and the Internet. We also have Jessica Aro here today with us. Jessica is an award-winning journalist and an investigative reporter with the Finnish broadcasting companies, ILES social media project, Ile Kioski. Aro is specialized in Russia, extremist and information warfare. Uh, she became the target of an still going international propaganda and hate speech campaign while she was revealing how pro-Kremlin social media trolls uh, act 
And this is a campaign that is still very much ongoing. Aro is currently working as an investigative journalist with a book project about Russia's information warfare. And she's also training a variety of different audiences to recognize and how to counter online disinformation. So I will first uh, give the floor to Edward, uh, after which Jessica will give her keynote speech. After this, we'll have a discussion, and uh, then I'll open up for the audience to ask questions, comments, and I hope we'll have a discussion amongst us also, because we have a very distinguished audience and knowledgeable one here today as well. You're also free to participate in the discussion online under the hashtag FRIVKOMF. Uh, so please spread the word online as well. And with that, I give the word to you, Edward. Lovely. Well, thanks very much indeed, Katarina, and thank the organi organizers. And I do think that Free World um, has been at the forefront of this. If you go back on the internet, you can see discussions um, five, six, seven years ago, which looked pretty, they were considered perhaps a bit alarmist at the time, but they, in, in retrospect, they looked pretty prescient. And I think that the um, security culture and, and culture of discussion on security issues you have here in Sweden um, is, is to be commended, and other countries should copy you. And thanks to the Konrad and now Stiftung um, as, as, as well. If you hang around in sort of media and political circles these days, you hear a sentence which goes something like this. We have this terrible new problem with fake news because Russia's doing all this, has started doing all this bad stuff. And this gets me quite cross, really, because um, I think that, the, as I'm going to say in the next few minutes, first of all, this problem is not new. It's new to some people, but that doesn't mean it's new. Um, the term fake news is profoundly unhelpful. Um, the problem isn't really even about information warfare, um, although that is a very important part of influence operations, but it's about influence operations more broadly. And the um, problem is not really just Russia. Russia is exploiting vulnerabilities that um, it has spotted, but other people could, could exploit those vulnerabilities as well. So I want to start off with the point about it. it this is not new. There are people here in this audience who were part of, who witnessed the Cold War firsthand at its peak. I grew up in the um, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, so I saw it as a child and a teenager, and my first job I was still dealing with what we used to call Sovietology. And a lot of what we're seeing is just rehashed, improved, reinvented, developed versions of what the Soviet Union used to do, and they did it all through Soviet history. And if you go back before the Soviet Union, you can even argue that um, the Tsarist Empire used to do this sort of thing as well. So the idea that we have suddenly entered into a profoundly new era is a profoundly mistaken one. And it's a sign of the shallowness and ignorance of people who say that, that they haven't bothered to look back at what was happening in recent years. I would particularly point out that even um, those who say that if you leave aside the Soviet Union, um, that Russia was conducting these sort of operations, um, admittedly very clumsily on a limited basis, but they were doing it in the form of the Soviet Union um, in the years after 1991. We saw it in the Baltic States, in Ukraine, in Georgia, and other places. And people from those countries came to the West and they warned us. Leonard Merry, for example, the Estonian president, gave a brilliant speech in Hamburg in 1994, which is still there on the internet, you can look it up, where he warned about the direction that Russia was taking at home, but also the way Russia was treating its neighbors and dealing with the West. And to my pleasure, um, not there on the website, but I can tell you this, that the Russian delegation was so annoyed at this speech that they got up and stormed out of the room. This was a Council of Baltic Sea States conference in Hamburg. And the leader of that delegation that got, out and got up and slammed the door was none other than a humble, corrupt official from St. Petersburg called Vladimir Putin, of whom we would hear later. But we were warned, um, and it's intellectually dishonest and morally, I think, reprehensible to say that we weren't. We didn't take the warning seriously. Maybe they were too, they weren't, maybe they weren't well phrased, maybe they were premature, but we were warned and we didn't listen. And we have to start from that basis, and I would say to go on from that, to take very seriously um, what the people who warned us then 
are saying now, because they were right then and they're right now. It has new elements because technology has changed. Soviet Union <coughs> conducted its disinformation operations using shortwave radio, telex machines, physical forgeries, use of media, corrupted media outlets in obscure media outlets in faraway countries. And the internet has brought immediacy, it's brought ubiquity, and most of all, it's brought anonymity, the ability to say things without anyone knowing who you are, whether it's an anonymous website or an anonymous Twitter account. The site may not say that it's anonymous. It may say um, DC leaks or USA politics today, to take two examples, the ones that were involved in the attack on the American political system. Um, but behind that, when you investigate, there's a big round nothing. It's hard even impossible, even for an intelligence agency, to find out who is behind a Twitter account, a Facebook account, or a website if it's been set up um, properly. You can go down to the railway station. Um, you can buy a debit card, a prepaid debit card for cash in Krona. With that debit card, you can go to an internet cafe, um, or even just using a smartphone, and you can set up a website, you can buy space on a server, you can register a domain name, you can do all this stuff, and it would be really, really hard, if not impossible, for anyone to find out who you are. And I think that one of the things we really have to deal with now, as we try and get out of the hole in which we're in, is we have to rethink the assumption in which anonymity is the default setting on the internet. But it's not just information. Sorry, I've got my water. Um, it's not just information. Um, information is an accelerant, it may be an instigator, information has all sorts of roles to play. Um, but these operations which are being conducted against us, whether you call them hybrid war or whether you call them influence operations, have many different elements. I wrote a piece uh, a few weeks ago which has attracted some attention called the Toxic 20. It could have been 19, it could have been 21, but I like the alliteration of saying Toxic 20. So I list 20 things that the Kremlin has in its toolkit, in its arsenal. They range from, for example, the intimidation, physical and cyber intimidation of individuals, which has happened to Jessica. They include just one category, military, and that's everything from regular and irregular warfare of the kind we've seen in Ukraine, plus also bluff and saber rattling of the kind that you experienced here on Good Friday a few years ago. So just one of those 20 is military. There's the use of the legal system to intimidate and obstruct um, critics of the Kremlin, whether it's issuing an Interpol red notice so that a critic can't travel, or tying people up in immensely costly and time-consuming lawsuits. That's just another one of the 20. And there's so many others as well. Psychological warfare, subversion, stoking um, divisions in society, whether they're linguistic or ethnic or geographical or social or anything else. So information is usually part of these operations. These operations usually work because there's an information component, but we are making a category mistake if we just look at the bit of the problem that we can see and think that's the problem. The information bit of the problem, of the attack, is the visible bit. Sometimes it may be most of it, maybe most of what's going on is an information attack on us, but sometimes it may just be a very small part, like an iceberg. Most of it is under the surface. So we always have to step back and say, what's really going on here? What's happening with the money? One of the very big weapons in the Kremlin toolkit is the use of money, um, whether it's to bribery and paying inducements, buying influence, all that sort of thing, or whether it's the um, use of targeted, highly targeted corruption, actually illegal use of money, or whether it's the completely legal construction of economic and financial bridgeheads in the target society with the result that people say, this is what my job, my paycheck, my future depends on, so therefore I don't want to get into a fight um, with Russia. So it's not a single problem. Information is very important, but we must never see it in isolation. The third thing that I want to say is that we are making a big mistake if we think that we have got a clear picture of what Russia is up to. When I look at the way in which governments and the analytical community are responding to this, I get the impression of someone who's driving a car looking in the rear view mirror. We are getting, I wouldn't say increasingly good, we are getting increasingly less bad at working out what it was that the Kremlin just did to us. 
So we go back and we look at things, whether it's um, the new research that's just come out in Britain on the Brexit referendum, showing that Russian state-backed media had a much bigger effect than we thought because of the amplification tools they had on Twitter. Um, there's all sorts of good investigative work going on trying to work out what happened. But what we're really bad at doing is looking through the windscreen and seeing what's coming up next. And my feeling, and, and I, this is based on 30 years of, of dealing with this, but it should be your feeling as well, even if you've only come to this in the last 10 minutes, is that the Russians are not stupid. They look at their operations and they do lessons learned. They said, they will say, this worked last time, it won't work next time. A very good example of that is the hacking and leaking attacks, which worked brilliantly in Poland. They worked brilliantly in America. Um, they, could, they tried them in France, and they didn't work very well. We can get onto that in a moment. And they didn't even try it in Germany. They had all the material. They'd hacked into all the different Stiftungen and the Bundestag and all these different bits of um, German political life. They had large numbers of emails, which if they had released them in the way in which they um, did in America, would have showed to, no doubt, the total horror of the German public that their politicians were committing politics. Because that's basically what the American scandal was about. It was politicians committing politics. They were trying to improve their own chances, do down their rivals, saying nasty things about people they didn't like. But if you leak that in the right way, people are horrified. They think this is a dirty secret being brought out in public. They could have done that in Germany, and they decided not to. Why not? Because they realized that this tactic had run its course. Maybe they'll try it again in future. They may even try it in, in your election. But the Russian tactics are evolving all the time. They look at what worked, they look at what didn't work, and they adapt. So I want to finish up by just giving you a, a, a bit of a heads up on what I think is coming next, which you might call next generation information warfare. And I think that's going to be about the manipulation and invention of audio and video. We all know, because we've grown up, thinking this, that a drawing is not a representative of real life. I can do a nasty cartoon of someone showing them doing something bad, and people say, well, that's just your drawing. So we, we've grown up with that over the, over the centuries. There was a time when we thought the camera couldn't lie. Everyone remember that? That photographs, have a photograph of something, that just proves it's happened. Now, I'm sure that this wonderful image here has not been photoshopped, but if you were told that for the sake of the um, you know, artistic impact that maybe one of those switches had been put there, they'd drawn an extra cable. You wouldn't think that was particularly surprising. You wouldn't think that was particularly bad. That's what people do. We, ex we accept that images can be manipulated. And if someone was to, for example, have a picture of, I don't know, ex-President Obama um, wearing Muslim Islamic formal clo clothing, people would say, well, that's just obviously been Photoshop. Yeah, we're, we're used to that. What we are not used to is the invention and manipulation of moving pictures and audio. And I think that's going to be a real problem. And we already can see, and I, I tweeted this today, those of you who follow, 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 follow me on Twitter, I said it was today's must read. It was a piece from BuzzFeed about just how quickly this technology is advancing. Now, it's one of the sad, dirty secrets of the internet that the fastest and most formidable push for technological change always comes from pornography. And it's no, 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 no different here that the um, pornographers have worked out that there's a market for people where you take a pornographic video and you insert the face of someone else um, on, the, on, on the body that is uh, committing whatever is, is, is happening. And that's now happening. There's a whole community on Reddit that gets involved in this. They're called deep fakes. The idea of a deep fake is it looks real. It looks if the per it's real video with real audio, the person, it's the voice you recognize, it's the face you recognize, and they're doing and saying things that have actually been totally invented. And that's going to be a real challenge for our democracy. It's going to start off by making people think that nothing that you see on television, nothing you see on the internet is real. Um, we're going to have to work to rebuild trust in our media. I think there are some ways in which you can do that. But once people think anything can be faked, they will assume that everything is faked, and that's going to be a, a, a really serious difficulty for us. It'll also mean, that you, and we're already used to the idea of anonymous social media accounts drowning out real voices. Jessica's had plenty of experience of this, but you can have anonymous Facebook accounts, anonymous Twitter accounts doing things. Well, just imagine if that's people making phone calls and they sound like real people. Imagine that you can leave a voicemail for someone which sounds totally authentic in the voice of a person that they know, but leaving a message that has absolutely nothing to do 
um, with real life. So my message here is we've got to be prepared for these techniques to, to evolve. Um, and we, I think the gap, and I'll leave you with this depressing thought, I think the gap between our ability to defend ourselves and our attackers' ability to attack us is growing rather than shrinking. And I don't see much that's happening right now that's going to turn it round. There are things we can do, but I don't think we have anything like the expertise or the willpower to do them just yet. And it won't change until we're a lot more scared and a lot more angry. And on that cheerful note, I'm going to hand you over to Jessica. <laughs> Thank you, Edward, for your excellent speech. And thank you for having me here. It's truly an honor. And I'm really excited to tell you today two stories. I will tell you what happened to me in 2014 when I started to investigate the then new phenomenon of Russian information warfare, the social media propaganda trolls. And I will also tell you what I found out in my investigations. Already back then, I seriously wanted to find out how do the trolls actually influence in people? Do they change some people's ideas? Do they even change some people's behavior? So we published one article. In this article, I asked specifically, have you become target of Russian troll army attacks? What were the attacks like? And did they influence you in some way? Also, I gathered all small information bits and pieces there were at that time about the trolls and the troll factory resided nearby Helsinki in St. Petersburg. And also a notion from the Guardian newspaper which had told that they had even thousands of troll comments under every news about Ukraine crisis. So... I even specifically said, do not name call any individual uh, trolls on Twitter or elsewhere. I'm investigating the phenomenon. So immediately I became target of fake news. So fake news about me were being spread on Russian information space. This is like a couple of days after my article went out. And in these articles I'm being framed. Uh, this very old school Soviet Union style technique. I'm being framed some kind of suspicious foreign agent. So I'm being told that I'm a famous NATO assistant and a helper of American and Baltic security <coughs> services and that I'm gathering some kind of illegal database and a name list of actual people who support Putin in Finland. Obviously it was not the case, but because also my contact information was published here, I realized the most important lesson of why disinformation is actually dangerous, not only a threat to freedom of speech, but also a threat to national security. Disinformation can and is used to agitate people into hateful actions. So mobilizing people, in this case, for example, uh, calling me from Ukrainian and Kazakhstani numbers, uh, making threats, uh, shooting gun, um, wishing for my kind of a criminal going to jail and stuff like that. Also, the trolls and troll activists on social media uh, organized a complaints campaign against me and Wiley, the Finnish broadcasting company, like, which is probably the most trustworthy uh, source of news uh, in the world, uh, at, le at least the most trustworthy in Finland, and which also operates according to the law and to the journalistic ethics. So the trolls started to complain. They made a really uh, formally good-looking, legally good-looking complaint, saying, again, that Wiley and me personally uh, break three different laws with the troll investigation, that we persecute Russians living in Finland, that we cause racism, even though I was seriously uh, investigating anonymous and fake profiles on social media. So anyways, people believed this and also sent these complaints to the parliamentary ombudsman. Also during these times, I was being informed as a threat to national security to the Finnish police, to the fin Finnish security police, and Wiley was also informed to the uh, Council of Mass Media for unethical journalism. Also, troll activists and professional propagandists, they set up a new trolling group called Funnily 
Russian troll army. In this group, the propaganda uh, operators who even work for different Russian state propaganda um, NGOs and propaganda agencies, they were agitating the conversations in these groups into a direction of serious hate speech. So they would say that it's your right, it's your freedom of speech to make, for example, illegal threats or death wishes of individuals in this group and to say that is only criticism. So in these um, comments made by trolls, uh, propaganda professionals and actual people agitated into this activity, I was being tagged into these comments in which just people were wishing for me to be dead and questioning my mental health and all that, and also wishing for nuclear attack to Ula Kioski and blaming me for bloodshed in Ukraine and blaming me for um, creating so much hatred against Russians that one Russian lady was killed in Finland. Also received text message from some person who impersonated uh, my father, who at that time had been dead for 20 years. Uh, so from somewhere, uh, some person found my personal um, phone number as well and found the information about my father and when he had been dead and wanted to inform me that he is actually alive and that he's observing me. So here I also realized that this is much more serious that than I had never realized and that, you know, nothing is sacred. Okay, so then I also went with my great colleague. In the meanwhile, while I was still gathering Finnish people's experiences and information about the trolls and checking the hints they were sending me about the influence, how the trolls actually influence people. So I went to the uh, St. Petersburg Troll Factory with my colleague. And from there, we found a very secretive place, which was recruiting at the moment. It had various recruitment ads online, and they were not looking for troll social media propaganda spreaders, yet they were looking for like copywriters and social media managers, even graphic designers. And they were also looking for people to work in night shifts and also produce texts online in Russian and in English. So we called there, we pretend that we are, you know, wanting to come to work there. And we asked, oh, what kind of texts do you want us to produce? And like, what kind of themes? And all they would say was enough, political themes. So, okay, night shifts, political themes, making materials online. Yeah, so we also uh, went there for uh, many days and we saw changed uh, changes of shifts. They are in every 12 hours. And I will show you, we really tried to get interviews from people who worked there at that time, but it was really difficult because everyone were being silenced and shut down. So I will show you one video which we forced out from one of the troll factory workers. Я думаю, что я наоборот буду помочь отвечать какие-то какие-то вопросы. Просто на вашу работу. Нет, я... я журналист. Если бы не воспользовался на работу, я сказал, что... Ну, вы журналист, я могу дать работу. Я журналист, я все не могу. Надо Ну, у меня все, я свои есть обязанности. Я все не могу ничего сказать. Ну, хотя бы скажите, если вы не журналист, но кто еще есть в агентстве новостей? Есть, есть у журналистов, вот вы можете их подкраулить. Ну, к сожалению, у вас журналист, почему-то болеет, сертифицировать. Вам запрещено говорить о своей работе? Нет, я почему? Ну, я просто не очень люблю принимать на телеграмму, когда ты просто там не люблю принимать снимать. Я же не снимаю, хотя бы... Нет, ну все равно, я не, не люблю вообще разговаривать на какие-то такие откровенные темы. Ну, никаких откровенных тем, господи, кто снимал вашу работу? Ну, я, я не очень хочу разговаривать на свою работу. Хорошо, можете теперь сказать, о чем решать ваше обеспечение? А таких, ну, я тоже, это разговоры работы. А что содержание ваш контент, это тоже государственная тайна? Да, ну, что здесь государственная тайна? Ну, что вы хотите? Ну, просто я не хочу об этом говорить. Вы можете 
Вопрос не начинается на голову, вы сможете сейчас петь кого-то, вы можете петь ворожки. Я, к сожалению, ничего никто не хочет рождаться. Ну, я, к сожалению. Вы можете начать, если можете дождаться. Вам тоже подъедет сюда. С вашей начальности вчера разговаривали тоже. Я, к сожалению, не могу вам ничего сказать. Я, да скажу так, сам ничего не знаю. Почему у вас на здании нет ни одного познавательного знака? Что здесь за организация? Ну, я не знаю, но это же не ко мне вопрос, это вопрос. Скорее всего, это начальство. Я обычно и рядовой работ не рабочий. А внутри там есть какие-то обозначения организации? Не знаю. Знаете, на выходные обычно бывают там? Ну, там есть вход в здание через по карточку и все. А какого-то списка организаций, там туда звоните так-то, туда звоните так-то? Я не знаю. Да, это... У меня нет такой просто информации. Если бы знал, сказал бы. Так как вы имеете информацию? Вы сидите или нет список? Да я не знаю, я не видел. Спасибо. 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 So yeah, this was um, the reality at the troll factory. And so these guys who were like in their 20s uh, and of whom many didn't want to work there much longer than two or three months because it's a really tough job, they were silenced with um, agreements in which um, they were forced to pay like tens of thousands of uh, money if they disclosed anything to journalists. And that why, that's why their response to our requests was like this. But yeah, anyways, we interviewed a journalist who had infiltrated in the factory and she told us that, for example, she was being forced to write how stupid Americans are in different shifts and in other shifts she would have to uh, comment uh, her own comments uh, as if there were more people in the conversation and also at, at some days she would have to uh, mock Russian opposition politicians. So this is the activity of Troll Factory. So here, finally, I uh, published uh, the results of my investigation on how the trolls actually influence Finnish people. And much of these results are apl applicable internationally. So I found out that many Finns, they told me personally that they had stopped commenting Russia issues online because the trolls had attacked them. Because the trolls had started to mock them or harass them and making them death threats, so they wanted to self-censorship themselves. Also, some Finns uh, had lost the idea what is true and what is not true, for example, about the case of Ukraine, because the trolls were spreading serious amounts of disinformation about the Ukrainian war. And also, one of the results was that some Finns were turned into propagandists themselves. So when people, some people, when they become subjected to propaganda, any kind of propaganda, they start to believe it, they want to share it further. And I concluded Finnish public debate was already back then manipulated by recruited citizen um, conversationalists. Also, there at some parts of the population, obviously, there was no influence. People told me that, yeah, we've seen the troll uh, attacks and troll operations here and there, but it's just stupid old school Soviet uh, propaganda in new channels, so we don't care about it at all. Also, I listed uh, the places where I saw troll operations and where Finns told me they had seen, and I also talked with many moderators of uh, discussion forums. Here are just some examples of troll messages being spread, just lies um, of Ukrainian um, situation, for example. Here is one source of trolling in Finland, so always the troll factories are not inside Russia, they're also outside, so here uh, I found out that the Russian embassy, its Twitter and Facebook accounts were being really trolling, and they were, for example, uh, spreading disinformation, accusing Western leaders of being Nazis, and so forth. Here, just an example on who is participating in the troll conversations. Here is a high uh, profile, our government official, who is active in the Russian troll army conversation and also giving his support to professional propagandists. Here is one operation against me, uh, started with Studio Quality Song being put on SoundCloud, then a uh, YouTube um, video was being made with English subtitles, again presenting me as some kind of NATO and America lobbyist, and they even hired or had somehow a communist theater, theater actress playing me. So they also created new anonymous 
um, groups on Facebook and bought visibility from Facebook to spread these pieces of art to an even further audience. So Facebook is helping these anonymous guys. Here, another uh, operation. So the troll activists went through old court files from where I'm from, a small city in Finland, and they found out that I had received 300 euro fine for drug use when I was like 23. And they made it into this. And they also contacted Wiley, my bosses, and asked for my res resignation and demanded answers why is Wiley uh, having drug addicts working for them. Here is just the tip of the iceberg of the headlines being created about me in the fake media. Uh, this was originally in Finnish, but uh, I translated it in English. Here also physical harassment and following this guy who works for What the Fuck paper, uh, one of the biggest pro-Kremlin and hate speech uh, fake news sites in Finland, uh, also follows me and other uh, researchers uh, in Helsinki and makes hate films and hate stories. Here someone has been copy-pasting intranet information from inside Wiley Internet and used it um, uh, with troll materials and sending it from fake emails to me and my colleagues just to create um, chaos. Here, um, fake criminal reports against me and my boss. Police found no crime. Here, what the pro trolls and propagandists want. They want their message, their narrative into the actual mainstream media, which has the biggest audiences. And here, a uh, very interesting happening also. Uh, so, October 2016, police told that they suspect that someone from inside YLE had provided information of my job assignments and my location to one of the pro-Kremlin extremists harassing me. So, there's an ongoing, or many ongoing, investigations. And here, just to show where the general trend uh, is heading, at least in Finland, uh, there is hate speech fake news articles being done about police who talk about fake news and propaganda or hybrid warfare or who start to investigate these guys and also not just the police but also officers and all kinds of researchers and people who talk about human rights and all that. So, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you, Edward, for, for your excellent and, and insightful presentations. Uh, so, I would like to start off the discussion by connecting this, your story, Jessica, and what you have been showing us, uh, and sort of the, the trends you're foreseeing, Edward, to, to the ongoing discussion about this topic. Uh, if, if we start off with terminology, uh, Edward, you mentioned in the beginning that this is not about warfare, and you said something that you see this as the toxic 20, or if you look mm. at actual measures being applied. Uh, why is this not warfare, would you argue, and how then should we see it? Because if we have difficulties labeling it, I imagine we have difficulties countering it. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think terminology is always lags a little bit behind real life. We have to try and find names for things. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant about the, the term warfare because it's so broad and we've had wars on terror and wars on drugs and, you know, I'd like to have a war on military metaphors and a war on exaggeration as well. It's just kind of, it, I think the, the word war is, is overused. Um, I think it's, it's worth reminding ourselves the way the Russians see it, which I think is also broadly the way the Chinese see it, that the world politics is a story of constant conflict um, and there's a spectrum between um, you know, sort of diplomatic and cyber and information at one end through to the kinetic high explosives and steel and hardened steel and concrete nuclear weapons and stuff like that at the other but there, there isn't a sort of in their mind there isn't a clear um, dividing line and that's certainly the message of the Gerasimov doctrine which was the uh, senior Russian 
military strategist, published a famous article a few years ago where he was actually looking at what he thought was the Western attack on Russia um, by means of all these different information and money and things like that. But it actually is also quite a good way of showing how Russia thinks it can influence other countries. So I'm, I'm, I, 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 I agree that the terminology is a bit difficult. But the thing that I'm really pleading for is don't just think it's about information. You know, there will be an information aspect to this. But it'd be inter I, I'm, it's, it's interesting to ask, why is Russia so sensitive to Jessica highlighting their use of trolls in Finland? And they, the fact that they're sensitive shows that you were onto something. This was something that they, they, they thought was an important asset. They didn't like it being talked about. They wanted to punish you for talking about it. Um, but they feel they've got their hooks into the Finnish debate about national security and the country's future. And so they don't want Finland to get close to NATO. They do want Finland to be, as they would see it, a reliable, i.e. obedient partner. Um, this, is a, you know, this is a matter of high geopolitics to them, and the information bit is just, a, ju is, is just one aspect of it. Jessica, what do you think that we should sort of label or see this as an example of? Is it warfare, or is it just a creative sort of public debate? I definitely talk about warfare, as that is also what the Russian themselves talk about, and what they also teach there, even at university level, and for which they have like uh, how to do it books about information warfare for civil servants and students and anyone interested. So in there, it's there's nothing special about you know they do information warfare, uh, they study it, some of them in the university level. They do it. There's nothing mystical. So that's then what we should also talk about if we want to talk with, uh, like, in detail. But yeah, I've noticed, for example, uh, in Finland, the officials say that, for, for example, the diplomats, they always talk about uh, information influence. Uh, and they justify it by saying that we don't want to use our adversaries' language which would be information warfare. But there are different approaches. I think the key thing is to just realize that there is organized uh, online hatred spreading going on, and something needs to be done about it. You know, forget about what you want to call it. Just do something about it and do quickly. You both touched upon the fact that trust is being eroded. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on that, and, and, and in what way are these actions, this warfare or influence operations, or, or, or call it whatever, in what way is this eroding trust, and why is that a problem, say, ahead of the Swedish elections? For example, um, what we've learned in Finland and seen in many other countries as well, is that the main one of the main targets is to erode trust in traditional media and in traditional journalists. And even um, by picking individual journalists or researchers for news medias, uh, that can be accomplished most easily. And by digging out dirt and nasty stuff, uh, or if it, if it doesn't exist, then creating it of individual journalists um, that um, trust can't be eroded. But yeah. And I, I think that the, um, first of all, if, if anybody here has not read my friend Peter Pomerantsev's book, um, please do so before the end of the day. Um, nothing is true and everything is possible. Um, and um, I think that the, the kind of reality distortions that the Kremlin used to seize control of the Russian political system um, are very similar to the sort of reality distortions that they're trying to use to attack our political system and the uh, highly respected um, national broadcaster like um, Wiley is a serious obstacle for them because it creates a common um, standard of truth. If you everybody agrees what happened yesterday, um, it creates a, a, a reference point where Russian reality distortions are much harder to implement if you have a, a very well-trusted correspondent of a very well-trusted media organization saying, I was at the front line in eastern Ukraine, I saw Russian soldiers, 
I'm here in Kiev, it's not run by fascists. Um, that is two very difficult problems for, for, for Russia to overcome. If you can say, well, that's just, um, that's just another view, um, and there's another person who says that exactly the opposite, it creates this sort of phony moral equivalence where you think that, uh, well, maybe the truth is somewhere in between, and that's already halfway to victory uh, for the Russians. Um, and so that the, our ability to trust sources, institutions, and people um, is a great source of resilience and strength in our society. And the more Russia can weaken it, the, the easier it is then for them to push their alternative institution sources and people. I want to follow up on that. You're, you're both journalists uh, working for highly respected uh, newspapers, broadcasters, and so forth. Uh, and we will address this more in the end of this conference when we have a panel uniquely uh, dedicated to the media situation. But still, would you say that media has adequately handled this issue. We had some instances in Sweden where highly respected newspapers sort of uh, repeated the Russian troll narratives, often spreading fake news directly. Would you say that th there is reason to actually distrust media in this? Um, actually, uh, if not to distrust, at least contact the chief editors and demand for better in-depth journalism than what is now being produced. Definitely there are, uh, in many countries, unfortunately, there are even journalists who are already afraid, who say that they don't want to touch, for example, Russia issues with a long stick, because it's just, they think it's messy. So these kinds of journalists, their editors need to be supported so that they will um, write these stories and that they will write truthful stories. And for example, yeah, here in uh, Sweden, in uh, Aftenbladet, in their culture section, there is uh, quite a lot of programming propagandistic pieces and it's really um, interesting and also worrying. And it has also been noted in uh, international and Swedish research. I think I'm not really a journalist anymore, but I was for 35 years. And I think that one of the key things that we have to do in, is to show the difference between our kind of journalism and Kremlin propaganda, um, which is not so much about content. There is no clear dividing line between good journalism and bad journalism. It's you know, largely a matter of opinion. Um, and there's no really clear dividing line between um, propaganda and bad journalism. And you can test this if you print out um, stories from bad tabloids that are, you know, as, as if they're sort of bad but honest, they're just trying to make a profit, but they you know, have rubbish stories. And you put them side by side with stories from Sputnik. And you can ask, I've done this as an experiment, even people who are doing graduate degrees in media studies can't work out which is the story from Sputnik and which is the story from the tabloid. You format them the same way, and it's very hard to tell. So I think trying to... Um, make this sort of hard distinctions on the basis of content is difficult. Um, but what we can do is much, be much tougher about who's saying it. So, for example, an absolutely key element of good journalism is the ability to recognise and deal with mistakes. And if you make mistakes, you have to you know, print clarifications, corrections, and sometimes you apologise. If you go to any reputable news site, you will find um, them there. Now, your homework, ladies and gentlemen, for today... Um, and a good party trick once you've done it. Can you find the only occasion where RT has ever actually apologised? Very, very hard to do. If you Google site rt.com apology, you find lots of stories where they're reporting how other people have apologised for things. But I, I, I've really done this as hard as I can, and I can, can only find one clear example of apologising. And when you look at it, you can then try and work out why they did it on that occasion. Um, but I, I think we should be, you know, we, the, the, it's the, the difference in procedure between an honest organisation and a dishonest organisation is a much better test of, um, of, of whether they should be trusted than trying to look at the, um, look at the content um, that comes out. So we, we touched upon the, the response from, from media and from established and, and trusted media. What about the societal response more broadly? Uh, some label these information campaigns, the Russian ones, as an ongoing war against the West. 
Would you say that the West has responded to this in an adequate way? It depends really um, on, a, on a country, a lot. And even, um, even it depends on, you know, maybe 10 years ago, there were some countries that were already uh, much more awake and their response was already back then much better and they were trying to really warn the rest of us but then they were not not so much listened to. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, that's about it. I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, there are countries, the Baltic states were facing Russian information attacks already in the, 1990, in the mid, early to mid-1990s. And so they got pretty sensitized to that and they have some um, things that have worked for them. They've also tried things that haven't worked. But this is, as I said before, this isn't a new problem. I think we are waking up to it now. But I think that the, um, one of the huge weaknesses we've got is the big tech companies, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, um, who are, to put it mildly, not helping. And we are rather, we are flailing as we try as individual governments to work out what to do. Do we ban, say, we're going to have a legal ban on fake news? And that sounds very attractive. Then you try and define fake news, and you go down this rabbit hole of what is, you know, are you going to ban all parody accounts? There's a guy who does a fantastic parody of Putin called Dark Putin KGB. I would hate to have a law that the Russians would use to take him, him off, off, off Twitter. Um, so I think we, we have... To, I think there's a... I mean, the British Home Secretary is actually, at this very moment, in California, I hope, shouting at Facebook about the, uh, their unwillingness to engage at all with researchers and governments on the question of um, the abuse of Facebook anonymity for harassment and so on. So this is a really live issue, and I think it's got to be solved with lots of governments all saying to these enormous, very powerful companies, um, here are some rules. Sign up. You, you have benefited from a free law-governed society. That's what's made you so rich and successful. You have to play your part in defending it. And, I, and one very big thing there is you've got to make it much... I think this is my single most important message, really... You've got to make it much easier for people to prove online that they're real and make it much easier for people to tell when they're dealing with other people online that they're not real. I'm not against anonymity, but I want to know, if I get a, 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 a message from you know, katerinatratch at gmail.com, I want some way of knowing that it really is you, Katerina, and not someone who's just gone to Gmail and set up an, an account in your name. That's technically possible, but Gmail doesn't, doesn't want to help, or Google doesn't want to help. Ditto with Facebook, ditto with Twitter. So I think that's the kind of front line at the moment. That's what we've got to push on. I'll let you react to that uh, in a second, Jessica. Just throwing in another question. You mentioned the Baltic states. Uh, do you see any other actors, uh, they can be state actors or non-state actors, companies that are sort of taking the lead on this? I, I think we're in a bit of a, in a shift here. To, to put it mildly, the U.S. Use, used to be seen as the leader of the free world, and recently the Washington Post posted a, a summary of the amount of uh, misinformation or lies coming out of the White House, and they calculated that uh, the American president uh, lies or spreads disinformation almost six times a day. So, so I wouldn't say that we can really call them the leader in this any longer. Do, do you agree? They still do produce a uh, massive amount of really high-class um, research on this topic. Mm. And they also have uh, their own experience about strategic communications, as they call uh, the state governs uh, information spreading. And yeah, they still have free press. Um, so definitely, I would say, they are amongst the leaders. I think you, you, you should not, shouldn't judge a society by its mistakes. You should judge it by how it deals with its mistakes. And I think that one of the effects of the Trump administration has been to energize a lot of Americans into taking um, media and information a lot more seriously. And subscriptions to the New York Times are absolutely booming. You know, they're finally you know, coming out the other side of this very difficult structural change. And you know, I think what America proves is you can make serious money doing serious journalism. And ten years ago, that wasn't that wasn't the case at all. So I'm not. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm worried about some of the things the administration is doing for other reasons. But I think that the 
you know, in a way, it's a, a, what Russia, the, the Russian argument is often a, a kind of straw man syllogism where they say, the West says it's perfect. Here's evidence that the West isn't perfect. Therefore, the West is rubbish. We don't say we're perfect. And their evidence of our imperfection is you know, well worth looking at. It's usually stuff we know about ourselves. And the fact that we are looking at it ourselves and trying to deal with it um, is, in a way, proof that we're not rubbish. And if you turn that on the head and say, um, give me examples of how Russia engages in you know, self-criticism. Show me all the people who are um, criticizing Putin's four-hour marathons for all the lies and disinformation that he comes out with during that. And show me all the enormous constitutional rows that are going on with the Duma trying to hold the Kremlin to account and holding up the, the, the Kremlin's budget and not voting it through and all the terrible court cases that Putin is mired in because the judges don't like what he's doing and all the worries he's got about the midterms where he may be able to lose control of the Duma. And you can immediately see there's no comparison between Russia's kind of stagnant, phony, pretend political system, which isn't really politics or theatre, and America, which is admittedly in a difficult situation, but where the political system is working as it should be. So the fact that I quoted an American newspaper uh, investigating the lies of the American president is hopeful. We could sum up. I want to ask a final question before we open up for the audience, uh, and this is if we go outside, if we look at the, the threat and the actors that are uh, carrying out these types of information. Uh, we talked a lot about Russia here. Uh, we heard Elizabeth in the beginning sort of pledging for us to, to open up a bit more. Uh, are we missing out by focusing so much on Russia? Are there other actors that we should in fact be putting our focus on? Well, earlier in my career, um, or 10 years ago, I started to investigate um, then new um, phenomenon, the Islamist jihadist YouTube recruitment and different kinds of jihadist uh, recruitment forums on internet through which people from Finland were being um, lured to go fight in uh, jihadist sites. So that's uh, only growing while we're talking about Russia. That's also a growing thing, so it needs more attention as well. Mm, and also the neo-Nazis and other uh, kinds of extremists in the far left too need our, our special attention all the time. But one thing I would really like to um, mention still, just concrete examples of, and cases from Finland which might also occur here as our societies are quite similar and uh, we have similar operators working in our societies. So. In 2016, uh, the Finnish Ministry of Interior, they decided that they will put now an end to hate sp speech pr spreading online, because they also knew that spreading hatred online causes hateful actions. It's scientific research, so they also received a notion from the UN that in Finland there's a horrible hate speech situation and something should be done. Then police was given more uh, budget to tackle this, and they even started an own anti-hate speech unit. And they also made communications about it, and guess what happened after that? Uh, some troll activists, they produced a network of fake hate speech police on Twitter, uh, which were so skillfully um, put out and designed, they used the police's own design, uh, that some of our high politicians and even some of our police leaders believed that they were actual and they retweeted them. And the um, police then had to later, because they were mostly spreading hate speech and uh, misogyny and pro-Kremlin stuff, so and they, because, mostly because they were imitating the police, which is illegal, police had to start investigating them. So, and they call themselves parody accounts. I'm not against parody accounts so long as you can see. You know, that, that's why that, ticker, that Twitter blue tick is quite important. You know, and, we, and I think it's a, only a very small beginning of what we need. But, um, but I just want to say on, on other... Yes, I mean, if just imagine 20 years ago, the Dalai Lama came to Europe. He met presidents, he met prime ministers, he met parliamentarians, he held public meetings, universities were glad to have him. Um, and we lived... We could discuss 
Tibet in conditions of political freedom. And then the Chinese lobbying machine got to work. And when the Dalai Lama comes to Europe, he's lucky if he meets one or two brave Estonian or Lithuanian parliamentarians. Maybe he'll meet a brief, brave Swedish parliamentarian as well. I don't know. But the Chinese have basically closed down um, the Tibetan um, flank completely. That was a huge victory to them. They've done it with a mixture of economic intimidation, diplomatic intimidation, um, cyber intimidation, social media intimidation, all you know, many of those elements of the top, toxic 20. And the result is that to, in, in, journalists who write about Tibet get harassed. Um, they've, they've won that one. And, and every one of the tactics they've used on Tibet are ones that Russia also uses. I don't know if they get together and compare notes, but as I said at the beginning, every single vulnerability that Russia exploits today, someone else can exploit tomorrow. Thank you. And with that, I would like to open up the floor for questions. Uh, when you get the microphone, please introduce yourself. My name is Carolina van der Pellen. I work for the Swedish Defence Research Agency. Thank you for brilliant presentations, both of you. Um, thank you for drawing us our attention to the term warfare. Uh, I also believe that we should abstain from that term. Uh, it is important because it determines who should respond and how. Uh, so it's not just, uh, I think, an academic debate. Um, thank you also for drawing attention to the fact that this is what Russia does. It defines it as, as warfare. They're in a state of war already. And if you go into a Russian bookshop, you'll find piles of books about the information warfare that the West is supposedly conducting against Russia. I wouldn't like to see that in a Swedish bookshop. Uh, I have a more specific question to Ed, and it's about the next generation warfare, uh, deep fake. Um, we, you, you mentioned in, in the um, debate um, the commercial interests of Google and Facebook. Um, the big actor here, I would say, is YouTube. This must be on their radar screen. Do they have any proactive uh, strategy for how to counter it and, and how? Thank you. Well, thanks, Carolina. Um, first of all, I, yeah, and I, I think competition is a much better word than warfare. We live in profoundly competitive and contestable societies where you have lots and lots of ways of competing on every front. And we don't live in militarized societies. Um, Russia is an increasingly militarized society. So when they say warfare, I would say competition. And you know, bat that straight back at them. I think that, I mean, I, I, I do talk to um, Google um, not, and, and YouTube not terribly successfully. I think they're beginning to realize that they are riding a tiger, that this is a, a, a kind of monster. And they don't really, you know, they, 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 the first thing they got their hands on was the, was, was pornography and child abuse. Then they started worrying about terrorism and sort of jihadist propaganda. Um, but they are often quite behind the... And, and, and one of their arguments is if it wasn't on YouTube, it would be somewhere else, to which I say, you've invested billions and billions of dollars in brilliant computers and servers and networks so that the video all loads. If the bad guys had to do it from some kind of crappy thing that would take... 10 minutes to load, that would already be a victory. So I, I don't buy this argument that, it, it, that, they, that it's nothing they can do. But I think, I think the answer is uh, we need to have cryptographic signature. So if you have done something and it really is you and you're happy with it, you should sign it. And people should see that your public key is there, it's been signed, you know, you, they can check it's been signed by you. And then if it's, if it's something that shows you and it's not signed by you, then the question is why? And I think ideally we'd have a kind of two-factor authentication. So if something comes out that is, um, say you've given an interview to the BBC, you sign it, the BBC signs it, and then that is um, the authorised version. If anybody wants to start changing it, well, it may be perfectly reasonable. It may be just they've taken a clip out of it or there's you know, something else, but it won't be signed. It won't have the same level of realness. Now that's going to require two huge changes. It means you know, YouTube's going to have to start having ways of signing things, and we're going to need a dis uh, distri distributed <laughs> and a proper cryptographic infrastructure, which Estonians have and basically nobody else does. Um, so I, um, I think it, the, the, the technical solutions are there. 
um, making them work is a kind of social and political question, which we are not there yet. I saw one other question here in the middle. My name is Carlos Nerimex, and thank you for two very, really good presentations, interesting, scaring also. Uh, I have a question for Jessica, and that is, what kind of support have you received from your company, ELA, from other journalists, from Twitter and Facebook, or whoever, in your, let's call it, fight against the Russian trolls? Oh yeah, excellent question. Um, without the excellent support from my employer, Wiley, uh, I wouldn't have continued one day. Immediately after I saw that there's now a, a serious meltdown happening, something I've never seen uh, in my life, uh, I informed them and we made plans how to um, secure my investigations. And, for example, I was given a partner to go with in St. Petersburg so that I wouldn't go alone and we would like seriously think ahead every step that we made. And also we would put in place many information security um, uh, things when we publish the stories. Obviously that doesn't stop the wave of uh, harassment afterwards, but at least we didn't get our sites cracked down. Um, from the general public, uh, really good support. Um, they sent me so much support messages, that's also vital. And, you know, I think and I believe that in such Western justice countries as Finland and Sweden, uh, we are first and foremost protected by our laws and legislations. So when stuff gets illegal, then the right place to look for support is police. And police, seriously, then, unfortunately, uh, has to look after our rights. So my basic right is, as a human, uh, to live, you know, untouched. So now we're then seeing how these rights are um, happening. Finland. We have a question from Gunnar Hökmark. Th thanks. I was sitting and thinking about if it is important or not to bring this up, about if we are to call it warfare or not. And, and um, uh, first of all, of course, I need a, feel a need to defend the topic here. <laughs> Uh, we have printed a lot of material, as well, so. <laughs> but, but but coming back to it, I, I I must I think it is important because it's a matter of how we are to assess it and how to to look upon it. Uh, Edward, you mentioned uh, maybe you should call it information competition, and of course there is a lot of competition as well going on. But if the aim is to make governments to fall or to undermine the sovereignty of a, a country, or if it is to change the direction of a society, or, uh, well, if you look upon, in the contest between US and the former Soviet Union and US and Russia, has ever US been so damaged as it is today? I'm not talking about the outcome of the election, but, but how the society is developing, isn't it more important? I mean, isn't it having the same aim as war planning sometimes have? And, well, Clausewitz phrased it uh, something like that, war, meaning conventional war, is the prolongation of, of uh, politics. Isn't it to be comparable to warfare if you can change the government in Serbia or make a government fall in Moldavia or, uh, or whatever? Um, well, first of all, it, some of us here in the audience remember um, America in the mid-1970s with the combination of, of Watergate and the catastrophic defeat in or, um, war and then defeat in Indochina. So people then were saying that America can, and, and all the terrible abuses that have been uncovered as well of the, um, inside America. So I think you know, we've, we've, we've had bad times before. I'm not sure this is... I'm not sure this is as bad now as we, as we had then. Um, it's tricky. I think terminology, it, you'll never get it exactly right, but I have a sort of broad feeling I don't like using Russian terms for things. Um, um, if you know, they have 
there's Russian jargon terms like um, agitprop or active measures, but that doesn't really resonate with the rest of the, you know, with the sort of wider public, and the, we need to talk to the public about it. So I think, yes, it's national security. That's a nice clear. This is our, our sovereignty, our ability to make our own decisions, um, our ability to support our allies and to live up to our promises. That's what's, that's what's un, under attack, the cohesion of our society. So I don't mind framing it in national security terms. And then I like the word operations very much, because this is not just happening at random. This isn't just that you know, the weather was bad over Russia and now the snow's coming in our direction. This is being planned. You know, money, Russian taxpayers' money, is being put into these operations. There are people in the intelligence agencies and, and military and in the Kremlin and elsewhere who work on this stuff full time. You know, those guys, people working in that building, they're all paid. So this is an operation, and I think to give the idea that this is something that is, this is agency, is being directed against us. It works because we're weak, so we have to plug the weaknesses. Um, but there is a controlling mind behind it, and that helps focus public attention a bit on the fact that we are being attacked and I don't mind the word attack, and I don't mind the word operations. But warfare, to me, dignifies it a little bit too much. And I think you've, uh, one of the results of this wonderful conference, I've decided that my column next week is going to be on why we should not use the word <laughs> hybrid warfare, information warfare. <laughs> wonderful though your title is. <laughs> Would you like to add something, Jessica? Nothing to add. OK, then we take the, the next question. Oh, hello, I'm Nicholas Rosbeck from the Swedish um, Defense Agency, FOI. I have two questions, actually. Um, uh, are the bad guys a step ahead in the sense that, if I understand you correctly, thanks for your fine presentations, uh, they try to undermine our societies. Will they now in the future try to pit Western countries against each other? You mentioned Brexit as a means to undermine the EU, for example. Will they pit France against Germany, Germany against Sweden, or with the help of Trump, the US against Europe, or vice versa? So that's one question. I, I have another question as well. Um, these best practices that we talk about, um, are they national or are they transferable? Or do each Western country need their own set of best practices as well? Thank you. Well, I think it's already happening. And if you look at Polish-Ukrainian relations, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I'd have said that there's been a permanent transformative change in these two countries that had an extremely difficult common history, and they're now best friends. This is really, really impressive. This predates Maidan. It was a, a really important shift um, of mutual recognition of mutual trauma, cemeteries being opened and cherished, um, common history books, uh, Polish-Ukrainian joint military unit. Um, it was the, uh, as important, I thought, and as permanent, I thought, as the French-German reconciliation after World War II. I thought it was a very profound change and all the sort of nonsense that you heard in the 1990s. It was exemplified for me by Radek Sikorsky issuing instruction to the border guards that they were to, when speaking to Ukrainians coming across the border, it was prohibited to use the word tick, which is sort of slightly demeaning um, informal thing. You had to refer to them either as vi if you're speaking Russian or, or Ukrainian or pan if you're speaking Polish. And I thought that exemplified the, the, the change. And that's all changed. Two, two and a half years of Russian influence operations in both countries and relations are in the toilet. Absolutely astonishing. A mixture of very clever targeted information operations using the Polish nationalist right to whip up grievances from the, from the war plus physical operations hiring hooligans to smash up and deface cemeteries in both countries. And the result has been a, a really serious deep freeze, which I, you know, people are deeply worried about. So it's happening already. They, they, it might even be a road test there um, to, for, for things happening elsewhere. And best practices, I think every country is different, but you can see, you know, compare and contrast is very useful. You see Russia has done something in another country, look and ask, could this happen in my country? Could they tweak it? Could they adapt it? Would it, you know, but, you know, because sure as anything, if the Russians see something that works in one country, they'll think, why couldn't that work in another? Um, but the common standard, I think, has to be looking at uh, anonymity, because that's a kind of universal play. Because when we set up the internet 30 years ago, no one said, hey, I've got this great idea. I'm going to create a network of networks. It's going to be the central nervous system for modern life. 
We're going to use it for everything. Finance, communications, infrastructure, the lot. It's going to be absolutely integral to the way we do business. And you know what? We're going to make it all based on anonymity. Isn't that a great idea? We never had that discussion. It just sort of crept up on us. And now we should make it creep down. Thank you. And I don't think... Or did you want Sorry. to add something? No, you didn't. Uh, so we have time for one final question. Yes? You were just waiting for the microphone. Yes? You could please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, hi. Carl uh, Orkestrom, Association of Foreign Affairs, Stockholm. Uh, and of course, thank you for wonderful presentations. Uh, my question is, uh, as Jessica uh, has personal experience with as well, that some members of our own countries are already become part of the propaganda machine of the Kremlin. Uh, so even if we talk about banning Russian troll factories and stuff, how are we supposed to deal with our own citizens who knowingly or unknowingly take part in this? You know, where does What's the difference between a criminal and the traditional useful idiot? So, yeah. That's a really Thank brilliant you. question. Again, I am most worried uh, about the people who are like less fortunate uh, financially, who maybe have problems finding jobs, who have too much time to hang out on internet and to radicalize themselves with the materials that are perfectly designed to radicalize people. So I have actually... Uh, thought of an initiative in which some officials maybe um, it sounds kind of harsh but maybe from the social um, department social or health ministry department uh, would make some kind of exit programs for such people because these people are the most vulnerable for any kind of propaganda not just Russian or Kremlin propaganda or like what the fuck style hate speech fake news but all kinds of um, bad influence from internet so there might be some idea in that but then again we as journalists try our best to also approach to the audiences that normally are not interested in the uh, mainstream media which spreads propaganda, so we also try to do our part. But then there is a big role to play uh, with the citizen organizations, too. I, as, I'm sorry, we can't have any disagreement here. I totally agree with what Jessica just said. And I do think this is one of the next generation attacks. It's the Russians are looking for people who are bored, people who are alienated, people who are disadvantaged and people who have already a strong interest. If you want to influence people with information, it helps if you're already in uh, a network which people are using for other reasons. So we see Russians using sports fans, um, gun clubs, bikers, uh, paintballers, survivalists, uh, anti-crime vigilantes, all these groups that attract people who've got a bit of time on their hand and are maybe already, as I said, a bit bored or a bit alienated. And they are sitting ducks for... Um, the Russians, because they, um, in many cases, they don't feel they have a great stake in the way things are. And we absolutely, and I think the Czechs, the Czech Center for Combating Hybrid Threats and Terrorism is really good here, because they get information about the sort of thing the Russians are doing there on, in, in, in the Czech Republic on exactly this front. And then they attack it from every direction. So they say, is this, you know, is this um, a counter-espionage thing? We should be trying to infiltrate it and turn it round. Is this a money laundering thing? There's much money going in there. Is it a social policy thing? Is it sports policy? But you know, which bit of government and which bit of society um, can we bring on board to try and, um, to try and counter this? But Thank the big you. challenge is when we do this, how do we defend ourselves against this sort of Putinist threat without Putinizing our own society? Because that's the great danger, that you, if you think they're attacking us with this sort of network threat, and so therefore we need to network everything on our side in order to push back, then though we may feel we're winning, we're actually losing because we're making ourselves into a kind of mirror image of, 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 of Russia. Thank you very much. On that rather constructive last note, uh, I will close this panel uh, and open for the next one. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you very much, Edward. Uh, and thank you, the audience, for the very competent questions. Just as a small token of our, our appreciation, we have a little gift for you. So. Thank you very much and let's thank them with a big round of applause.